Good afternoon. Uh, we are going to start our session on uh, uh, free uh, from uh, violence, free to change the world. This is the title of our wow. session. And uh, specifically, this session is going to address the issue of uh, female genital mutilation and child marriage. So basically, the ones that are under uh, uh, and so-called harmful practices, uh, which is a special uh, and particular uh, violence against uh, women and girls. And uh, we will have distinguished panelists who are going to uh, lead us through different uh, blocks. The first one will be on uh, regarding the data and the impact of female genital mutilation and child marriage on uh, girls and women's health, well-being. Um, the second block will be to discuss progress, uh, change that is happening and uh, challenges that we are still facing and how we could overcome those barriers. And the third one will be the way forward and uh, some recommendation. And we would like you also as the audience to participate. So the first thing that I would like to ask is, does everybody has download the application of the EDD? And uh, this is session A1. Uh, on the, the, the afternoon, four o'clock. So please make sure that you're connected in that session and because we all want you to participate and we are going to uh, ask some questions and uh, you will have also the opportunity yes. to uh, write some uh, questions to the yeah. panelists. Peut-être dans la poche. Sorry. We're going to uh, uh, also, you can type your questions and I will see them here. I can uh, raise them with the panelists. So please uh, feel free to uh, really use the application as it has been designed for that. And also we would like you to uh, call you to in and invite you to tweet uh, and uh, you know some other social media that you may be able to access. Thank you so much for coming and joining us in our reflection of this afternoon. And um, I would like to start by a, st a, a, a story. And uh, that story is about Malika. Malika is a young woman that I met uh, about four or five years ago in Ethiopia. She is uh, living in northern Ethiopia in the Afar region. So she's an Afari woman. And when I met Malika, actually she was uh, in her hut and she was lying in the bed and she had a beautiful baby near her. And I was uh, you know, wondering what was happening and people told me, oh, she's really, really sick. She uh, you know, has not been able to uh, you know, uh, move out and do uh, her regular task as a woman uh, since uh, uh, she got the baby and she's in a really bad shape, et cetera. So uh, this is how the story started. And I asked Malika, but what happened to you? And so I'm going to quote her. And she told me, I'm now in a bad situation. I better die than live with this pain. And I said, what happened? And she said, I was severely hurt when I undergo FGM. And so she undergo FGM when she was 18, uh, uh, 12 years old, 12 years old. And in that area, uh, usually uh, the girl is taken, uh, you know, out, uh, out of, uh, of course, uh, where the community is living. I w just want to remind that this is a nomadic community who is moving around. And uh, uh, the practice consists in tying the girl to a tree uh, having a hole down there, uh, cutting her uh, clitoris and the labia minora, and then sewing the uh, labia majora of the girl. So they, as they say themselves, you know, only a small hole uh, remain to uh, allow for uh, urine. And this is a practice that is quite common, what that we call infibulation in that area of... Uh, um, Ethiopia. And uh, another thing, she continued to tell her story. And Malika told me, she said, 
following this FGM, I was sick. I in bed during three months, and the wounds take time to heal. Uh, but finally, she recovered, and then she said, then I was severely hurt when I got married. And she got married when she was about 15 to 16 years old. And she said, the one who married me couldn't take my virginity. I was cut open with a razor blade. Sorry, Mike, okay to allow the intercraft. So she was open to be able to, for her husband to take her virginity, and this is the expression that they're using. And then she continued and she said, then I had another problem giving birth. And this is why now I'm here, lying here, and I'm not able to do anything. And she said, I'm now a dead person. And this is her word, her a dead person. This is a true story. And you can uh, see this story in the uh, internet. You can type true story on FGM uh, in Ethiopia. You will be able to look at the whole testimony of uh, Malika. I just want to say that uh, uh, this was one of the most touching uh, issues uh, that I had to face, where this woman went through both, of course, FGM, child marriage, and of course, childbirth and was completely in disabled. And now she, from a very nice and, 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 and healthy girl, young girl, she moved into someone with disability. And I just want to uh, reiterate that female genital mutilation and child marriage incurs a lot of cost that cannot be quantified. And recently, for example, we had, of course, a report from the World Bank that came out about child marriage and the cost of child marriage. But there is a lot of cost that we cannot count when you talk about this issue. And we cannot count about the damage of happiness, that's to the happiness of young girls. You cannot count about the psychological trauma. You cannot count the isolation, because she had a fistula and she was isolated, actually, in her community. You cannot count anxiety disorder, sexual dysfunction. All these issues actually cannot be counted. But what we are counting more and more, and this is also important because we want to bring that issue on the table. And for advocacy, we need also to be able to convince. We are counting a little bit more uh, the cost for communities, for economies, and we know that there is a cycle of poverty from mother to daughter that also need to be counted. So having said so, I would like to call uh, for the, the distinguished uh, uh, panelists of this afternoon, and uh, I will start by calling Minister uh, Dimitu Ambisa Bonza, who is the head of office of the Prime Minister and Cabinet Affairs Minister in Ethiopia. Please, Madam, join us. Thank you. Minister Dimitu Ambisa dedicated public service career spans more than three decades. She has worked tirelessly to improve the life of millions of women and girls in Ethiopia. She provided exemplary leadership on the mobilization of community resources to empower and protect women, girls, and vulnerable children. Thank you, Madam, for joining us this afternoon. I would like to call the second panelist, Marie-Pierre Poirier, uh, who is the UNICEF Regional Director for West and Central Africa. She's based in Dakar, and she provides leadership for 24 country offices across the region. So uh, Marie-Pierre is going to share with us a lot of her experience for working in what we call Wakaro, Western Central Africa region. And she will also be able to share the experience because UNICEF is leading with UNFPA two global programs to eliminate child marriage, and another one to eliminate female genital mutilation. So she will be able to share her experience in that area. Then I would like to call uh, Madame Angelique Kidio. Angelique, uh, welcome. We have seen you this morning during the opening session. Thank you so much for uh, the coming. 
And uh, Angelique Kidjo, of course, I will, I will present her. She's three-time Grammy Award winner, and she's one of the greatest artists in international music today, a creative force with 13 albums to her name. But then you have seen how she's using her voice uh, with that video, and Angelique is using her voice as UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador for girls and women, for education, for uh, elimination of child marriage, elimination of female genital mutilation. And I still remember this wonderful concert that you gave four years ago in New York in the General Assembly Room on female genital mutilation elimination. Thank you so much, Angelique, for joining. Dr. Morisanda Kuyate, please join us. Uh, who is the, uh, currently the executive director of the Inter-African Committee on Harmful practice, uh, Traditional Practices Having Effect on Health of the Women and the Children, commonly named IAC. IAC is an NGO who has uh, 29 uh, national committees represented in Africa, but also in Europe and in the US. And uh, Dr. Kuyate uh, is uh, leading uh, this institution for several years now. But I would like to say that I met Dr. Koray Kuyate about 25 years ago, and he was the head of the Ministry of Health, uh, Reproductive Health. And uh, we had a project at that time, but Dr. Kuyate, as soon as he saw me, he said, you know what, I have a passion. And I said, what is your passion? And he said, I want to eliminate those traditional practices of female genital mutilation and uh, child marriage. And that was his passion since 30 years. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kuyati. And our last panelist is Natalie Tingo, who is our EDD Young Leader. Please, Natalie, join. So she's the last but not the least. She's going to challenge us today. And Natalie is a founder of, uh, and director of Mishana Empowerment Korea. She's from Kenya. Uh, and uh, this NGO is a grassroots-based uh, organization that is committed to work uh, to end female genital mutilation. But more than that, Natalie is also a survivor of gender-based violence and rape. And she really is a strong activist for girls and women's rights. Thank you so much for joining, Natalie. So this is going to be our panel. Please, a round of applause for them. And uh, before that, we are going to have, we have the pleasure to uh, have Mr. Stefano Manservisi, who is the Director General of Directorate General International Cooperation and Development, DEFCO, who is going to do an opening uh, statement. Thank you, Mr. Um, Manservisi. Well, I, I'm, I'm plenty of mics. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if what I will that one is be saying will deserve all these mics. That's so good, I think yes. it would be much more important <laughs> to have you uh, in running the show. Well, thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you to all the, the distinguished panelists uh, to help uh, all of us no? to reflect about uh, the state of play uh, of, uh, of the situation and to assess together what we can do together. I mean, uh, these, uh, these European Development Days are about gender. And, uh, you know, we try to also to organize debate around uh, what are the key challenges. We say empowerment, uh, we say discrimination, we say physical and psychological integrity. Here we are, in a sense. We are more identifying the, I mean, the latter point for this discussion. For us, uh, is an issue of policy, is, a, is an issue of uh, civilization. Therefore, we are here in order to be helpful and uh, in be helpful in uh, in transforming societies, because this is not uh, with external interventions uh, or money or, more, or doing the morale to people that we are able to be partners, but rather to, they say, to understand and to build uh, paths and ideas in an innovative way in order to, uh, they say, to address this. I mean, is, there is not only here discrimination, it's simply the fact that uh, there is no opportunities, there is no equality opportunity, there is no, no possibility as long as these practices are going on. And uh, uh, the daily life uh, of, uh, and the lifetime, let's say, 
of a girl which uh, is born today in Africa or in Asia is totally different from what could be the trajectory of uh, the same girl if uh, uh, born in the United States, in America or in, in Europe. Now, uh, in Africa, and all the practice of the uh, female genital mutilation is still ongoing, you know, the cutting affects uh, the whole uh, health life, I say physically and psychologically, because it's part uh, precisely of a conception of a society, because this is, is the reality. And um, it's not only the pain, uh, the bleeding, the swelling, the infection, the problems uh, of every day and the psychological shock, there is also let's say, the chronic uh, genital infections, uh, the, and uh, what uh, is situating the person, the girl, in a society. This is... And uh, it is wider because it is, uh, uh, it is creating barriers to, to education. It's uh, creating barriers to economic opportunities. I mean, I, this is realistically what is the practice, although the starting point should remain at the person level, because this is, uh, you know, what, uh, what matters more. I mean, uh, you know, there are 650 million of forced marriage in the world, you know. And, uh, and uh, the majority of them, or close to the majority of them, are for young girls uh, below 18. And uh, all this is not everywhere, not always prepared by, by genital uh, mutilation. I think that this is the scale of the reality, and uh, you know, it goes from uh, less than 18 and close to 10. This is the area in which uh, we, we uh, are working. And uh, this is, uh, uh, aside to this uh, figure of 650 million, there are an estimation of uh, 68 million of girls uh, that will be cut between 15 and 2030, if this practice continues as it is with 150 million additional girls which are projected to marry and cut by 2030. Now, this is a situation which is dramatic, which is unacceptable. I, I say that not only in human terms, uh, but I say that increasing in cultural terms is not uh, imaginable that uh, in, in societies which are confronted every day with the, what we used to call globalization, which is opportunity and threats, but where the individuals, in any case, either a protagonist or is threatened, but there is an individual, uh, an, an, an integral individual, then these kind of practices in societies are considered normal. This is what is, uh, you know, not only the unacceptable individual dimension, but the toti total has, is to historical. I mean, it's something which cannot exist anymore. This is the point. Cannot exist. It's not a question only of people, it's a question of the, the dimension of all this. This culture must be reformed from inside, and therefore this is what I think we are doing all together with the joint work with UNICEF and FPA. You know, we have reduced this, you have reduced this, because this is something that the women and, and the men uh, of this society and country are able to address. So the phenomenon has been reduced a bit. But the real issue is to take it out of culture, to, keep, to take them out of justification of culture. Sometimes not only culture, with culture I also put beliefs of all kinds. Uh, I think that this is something that can uh, only be uh, done if uh, we are partner and if we are working together in order to open the space of freedom, in order to allow everybody to decide about the integrity of his own body, if uh, uh, everybody is free to express criticism and is free to reform a society. This is the only way. The reason why uh, uh, we launched with the UN this Spotlight Initiative with this focus precisely in fighting violence against women. We wanted to do this in a way which is top-down and bottom-up. Top-down because we strongly believe that this is part of what we used to call a sort of multilateral engagement, where the top people which are responsible for the world must work in order to take responsibility, open responsibility, to end all kinds of violence, not only the uh, genital mutilation. And this is something which at the same time a strong, uh, let's say, support to the multilateral approach. Multilateral approach is not a, a bureaucratic sentence, it's the sentence of solidarity. Uh, only these things can be done together and therefore to contribute 
to the, a better governance of the world, the two big multilateralist UN, by definition, and the European Union, because we have built a multilateralism at regional level, you know, based on values, which are precisely those which are suggesting to work on this, is the first thing. Therefore, I mean, open responsibility taken at the highest level, Secretary General Guterres, Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohamed, on our side, the highest, uh, um, uh, the, the, the highest responsible of the, the European Union, HRVP Mogherini, Commissioner Mimisa, President Juncker. This is the first thing, in order to tell a message to, to everybody, possibly to the next G7, you are responsible and you have to take uh, initiative. But then, to build these spotlight initiatives, not only on money, the half a billion of euro that we have put as the European Commission on the table, but uh, to, be, to be based on a method, identifying the countries, differentiating the phenomena, and work with the grassroots organization. Here is the bottom up, which appears. You know. And uh, differentiate meaning, means m making an analysis. Domestic violence is prevailing in certain parts of the world. Uh, 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 genital mutilation is prevailing in other, in Africa. Uh, discrimination which is uh, taking um, uh, people and, and women out of the society up to femicide, Latin America, for example. You know. So a differentiation, but all linked with the, same, with the same approach and violence against women. And this is in the interest of women and the interest of the whole of society because without uh, ending this uh, violence, this society will never develop. Therefore, our approach is this, top-down, bottom-up, working with the civil society, allowing that space, uh, let's say, uh, wider, allowing that capacity are wider, allowing that awareness and, and, and uh, let's say, the courage of standing and denouncing is there. So, l not leaving people alone and making clear that we are with them for the little we can do. You know, as a partner, as a, as a, as a, on a base of experience that we, we share. Violence is still existing in the European societies. So, therefore, I think uh, the, the good of the SDGs is that it's obliging everybody to think about itself also, not just, you know, to go outside. This is what we are doing with the Spotlight Initiative. We hope uh, that we are contributing. Contributing also not only where we are intervening with the projects, uh, with the, all what we are doing, but also with Goodwill Ambassador. I would like to thank very much because, uh, because I repeat, it's not just a question of doing, it's a question of allowing to do, uh, to allow courage, to allow standing and denunciation, to allow you know, the, the reform from inside. Without this, it will be, will be impossible to succeed. So it takes time, but, but the result is there, uh, hope is there. Uh, the protagonism of, uh, uh, of, of women and women organization is there, the determination is there, sometimes also from government, you know, in spite of resistance of pocket of the society. We have to work uh, along this line. I was in Canada uh, for the G7 development uh, last week, and it was very interesting because uh, since years we didn't have uh, a meeting G7 in development format. And this is due precisely to highlight the importance for the big uh, decision in the world of the women dimension and the young girls dimension, which is a way to enrich our debate and to enrich the way in which we are thinking about what the, the powerful people in the world can do. This is a bit, uh, has been the discussion. We are working now to put some small words, maybe in this magic communique, no? which are running a bit the world, in order to tell a short story. You know, can talk about uh, big stories. We can talk about trade. You can talk about reforms. You can talk about economy. But if at the end, the human being is not taken into consideration, and in particular, women and young women are not uh, the center of our test, if we are able to improve society, then we produce communique, we produce big powers, we produce big policy, but then this will not change eventually. Therefore, we are working in order to see if we are able to drop something in order that our and your fight can advance, supported a bit also for this. But thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for all the contribution that all the panelists will bring, and I hope that we can advance along this line. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Mr. Manservisi. And I heard that you asked the question,
We ho I hope that the EC contribution will make a difference. I can tell you that the EC contribution will definitely make a difference, uh, you know, uh, to within those countries, but also more globally. And the Spotlight Initiative is really an important investment that you are making. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of lessons learned. There is a lot of good practices. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a way to we have really improve, uh, you know, the intervention. And we know that you know bottom up and top down is quite important. But we also know that the cross cutting, uh, uh, you know, uh, among the sectors is also important. This issue of FGM child marriage need to be mainstream into development, and we know how to do that. So I can say that in. In a few years, in 2023, we can come back here and show the results. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we have another speaker, uh, guest speaker, Katarina Furtado. Uh, please, Katarina, uh, you can uh, join us. And Katarina Furtado is one of Portugal's best loved television personalities and celebrities. She's well known as a TV, theater, film actress, as well as author, a TV host, a journalist, and a documentary filmmaker. Katarina is a UNFPA Goodwill Ambassador since 2000. And more than that, Katarina has been the champion for women's rights. And I visited her fantastic, fantastic home and shelter that she created in Lisbon. Thank you so much, Katarina. The floor Thank is you yours. Thank you so much. And I have to say, it was a wonderful speech. Thank you. So, Excellences, Ministers, Distinguished Audience, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. Gender-based violence and harmful practices against girls are not only a violation of human rights, as you know. They also reflect the low status of girls and women in too many places and are a drag on the well-being of girls and women, communities, and also economies. During my many missions as UNFPA Goodwill Ambassador and also TV documentarist, I have spoken and listened, it's really important to listen, to girls and women affected by violence, FGM and child marriage, a lot of them. When I met Fatumata, for example, she was 17 years old. She had been married at the age of 10 with a man of 45. She was his third wife, and he hoped she would give him the son he had never had. Fatumata had not her first period menstruation, the mannership. From the moment she became a bride, at the age of seven, she stopped attending school and started helping the family in the agriculture and taking care of the young brothers and sisters. Fatumata got pregnant at the age of 11 never went to a medical appointment, and the delivery, although it was in the health center, there was no money to pay for medicines and services. The delivery was very delayed and difficult. There was no cesarean. Fatumata had FGM. The baby was born, and Fatumata gained a new life, a baby to look after, when she should be playing with dolls. After a while, Fatumata was rejected from family home. The Fistler, obstetric Fistler, made unwanted. And she was deeply sad, as you can imagine. Today, and this is the good news, Fatumata lives in Bissau, Guinea-Bissau, Bissau the city. She was treated by a team of foreign doctors and nurses, and she's alive again. She feels alive again. She feels like she has a new life. Last December, I have found Fatumata in the campaign of Portuguese and Guinean girls and women who work to end harmful practices and child marriages and say yes to education, health, equality, and rights. The good news is we know how to change this. We know. We have seen that rates of FGM and child marriage can drop rapidly in places where the issue is addressed by governments, by communities, by families. Where social norms are confronted village by village. And I saw this happening, and it's really emotional. 
where laws are enacted to make it a crime and where those laws are enforced, where wider access to health, education and legal services ensure sustainable change, where girls and women are protected and empowered to make their voices heard. This is what UNFPA and UNICEF joint programs on FGM and child marriage do together, which is really good, with many other partners, thanks to the support of dedicated donors, including European Commission. Governments in developed and developing countries, civil society, international organizations, grassroots and community level organizations, religious and community leaders, you and me together, we need to bold and loud all of us together every day till 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katarina. Thank you for being a so great advocate. So uh, without uh, losing time, we are going to ask some questions to our panelists. And the first question will be for Marie-Pierre Poirier. Please, Marie-Pierre, we'd like to know, and if you can give us some idea of the scale of child marriage globally, but also in uh, West and Central Africa region. Thank you. Uh, OK. Just. Um, uh, two words before I get to that question to acknowledge the, my panel members. I'd like to commend the minister for the remarkable decrease in child marriage in your country. Nice. Welcome the role of civil society. Say that the voice of artists is the voices that we will finally get the topic listened to and how uh, young people um, voices and experience is essential. So just to say, as the DG has mentioned in his introductory remark, this is a, a societal plan that we all come together. Now, global figures. Today, we have 650 million girls and women who are married before the age of 18 as children. Mm. It means one in five girls married across the world each year, and that's 12 million girls. The good news is that the prevalence is decreasing. It used to be one in four. It's now one in five. The South Asia region is where we've seen the greatest decline. It dropped 50 from 50% to 30% in the last 30 years. But in West and Central Africa, my region, we are almost still at one in two. The figure is actually 41%. That means uh, for the girls married before 18, we have 14% uh, of girls married before they are 15, 3 million girls. These are average figures. You have countries like Togo, where it's about 20% of girls married before 18. Countries like Chad or the Central African Republic, 70%. Two. Six out of the 10 countries in the world where you have the highest rate of child marriage is in West and Central Africa. And a concern for us is that while the decrease is seen in other parts of the world, we don't see it in our region. Maybe because we started with very high rates, maybe because the decrease is slow, but also because of the demographic explosion and the very um, high numbers of, of, uh, of births and new uh, children and young women. So in fact, it's a girl from our region who faces the highest risk of being married as a child, and we need to know this because if we want to impact global indicators on child marriage, then we need to have to make a difference in West and Central Africa. Just one thought, the DG mentioned it again, child marriage has a huge cost, and maybe we are more familiar with the cost on the girl themselves and on the community, but child marriage has an extraordinary impact on economies and societies. It totally goes counter to efforts to eradicate poverty. The World Bank estimated that child marriage is costing developing countries $4 trillion by 2030. So in case anyone needs an economic argument besides all of those on the table, this is one. So our, our, our call really is that we really need urgent action to end child marriage in West and Central Africa if we want to progress towards that common objective and if we want to move in a significant manner towards the SDGs. 
Thank you so much, Marie-Pierre. Uh, and I will ask the same question to Dr. Morissanda Kuyate, but regarding uh, female genital mutilation. So Dr. Kuyate, uh, the IAC has been instrumental in, uh, uh, you know, creating the 6th February as International Day, uh, zero tolerance for female genital mutilation, and also instrumental in uh, bringing, you know, the African-led a resolution at the General Assembly. Uh, what exactly, can you tell us first, you know, what is the scale of this practice also on the global level, but also in the African region where you are acting uh, more? Thank you very much. Allow me to speak in French. I think you have your translation. Je voudrais d'abord remercier. I'd like to start off by thanking this panel's organizers, and to say that we are talking at the moment about a, a very important and emotionally charged subject. I'd just like to give you an idea of uh, FGM from a different point of view, because for 30 or 40 years now, uh, since the Inter-African Committee was established with all the range of partners, we've been saying the same thing now for 30 or 40 years. Perhaps we have to find a new way of saying it. We've got uh, 29 countries in Africa practicing FGM at the moment. And in some places it's 99%, in other countries it's right down to 1%. But that doesn't mean much in itself, because in countries where the one, it's 1% 1 frequency, it will be restricted to one little region. But when you go to that region, it's 100% of the people there. So it might be 1% of the country, but it's 100% in that little pocket. And that means that the figures you look at don't give you a true picture of reality. And I'd also like to say this isn't an African phenomenon. We've come to realize that you've not only got 29 African countries practicing FGM, but other countries outside Africa, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, Indonesia. They practice FGM. So that changes our whole concept of what FGM is. I'd also like to add another important thing. There are figures that we are not being told, that we're not telling you. When the Inter-African Committee started in 1984, we said that we would have put an end to FGM by 2000. But from 1984 to 2000, 32 million girls underwent FGM around the world. In the year 2000, the United Nations fixed the Millennium Goals by saying that by 2015 they wanted there to be no more FGM. And between 2000 and 2015, 30 million young females were submitted, submitted to FGM. And in 2015, the UN set another goal, 2030, to put an end by FGM by 2030. But I would just like to say that from 2015 to 2030, we are expecting excision or mutilation of 68 million girls because the population is increasing. That is the real FGM situation. In other words, we've got to get out of our familiar framework to see how we get to deal with this disturbing situation. The harder we fight, the more is happening. So this it is an FGM is a genuine insult to humanity. It is an insult to girls. It is a, an aggression against women. And whatever excuses might be made for it, nothing can justify FGM. Absolutely nothing. Religion, social pressure, politics, none of that can justify it. FGM is justified by nothing whatsoever. It is a very serious and important issue. And there's, as long as there's one single girl at risk of, un, of, of FGM, the whole of mankind must fight against it. Thank you. Yeah.
<rire> toujours aussi engagé. Thank you very much. Very committed as ever. And we will remember that figure of 68 million. 68 million is the figure you gave us from 2050 to 2030. And this is rather what Marie Pierre was saying. We have demographic trends running against us. So prevalence is on the way down. A great deal of work is happening and and and, and uh, frequency is going down. But the actual number of girls being born in countries where threat is FGM is going up. So we have a challenge. We've got to move along much faster than the demographic trend. And this is our this is this is our, this is a high speed race. Thank you. Natalie. I would like to ask you as an activist and uh, as your young leader also and working at grassroots level, can what can you say about female genital mutilation and child marriage, you know, and the impact on the lives of girls and community. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just listening to what the doctors said, it's given me a rush and my heart is beating so fast. But I would like to tell you something. Before my flight left from Kenya, I got a call from a woman who was in hospital and she was nursing serious wounds because of being battered and she had no home to go to after probably hoping that she heals because her only mistake was saying that she'll not allow her daughter to undergo FGM this year. Mm. And it's easier for us, like you said, for us to find something to justify FGM. It's easier for us to call it a cultural practice. It's easier for us to say something else. But the truth is, it's an, a system of oppression. And at the core of it, it's sexual abuse for children. Honestly, I need to leave this place and go back home and look at the eyes of girls and women and tell them that they are not alone and that the world is with them and no one has given up on them. And that if we relent in our action to work to end FGM, it means that we've given up and we'll keep on hearing this situation coming up again and again. We'll keep on hearing these figures, but honestly, it doesn't have to happen like that. Right now, I'm a very emotional person, but I tell you that I'm out of tears to cry at funerals of girls who are dying and we are burying them every single time because of FGM. And every time I walk in my community, I see what economic implication FGM is having in my community. And we can't just see it and just say, oh, it's going to end sometime. No, action needs to happen and we need to accelerate that particular action. And I believe from where I stand, and I know from where you're looking at it, is that we can indeed end female genital mutilation in our generation. And how can we do that? In our lifetime and generation as well. And how can we do that? It's as simple as going back to the basics and supporting communities and supporting community-led action. I believe that's the best way that we can go about it. Mm. Because I got angry enough to do something about it. And you should too. I don't think we need to be talking about FGM in the next couple of years. It needs to end. Because like you've said, it's a violation of human rights. And it's not right that a girl will have to lie down and expose her genitalia for it to be cut, for her to be called a woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for this insight. And I will turn uh, to Angelique. Angelique, I know that you're traveling all across Africa and you're meeting as, uh, you know, as Goodwill Ambassador of UNICEF, you're meeting with girls and girls that have been married uh, or girls that, uh, you know, are, are, are not yet married, but the family would like them to get married. So what, are, what do they tell you, uh, those girls? What's, what's, when you, what kind of discussion do you have with them? Well, um on the FGM issue, I'm kind of shocked, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to gather myself together and talk to... I think I want to say something briefly about FGM. If the number of doctors is right, we're doing something wrong on the messaging mm -hmm. and the way the leaders in Africa are not reacting to this. Exactly. So FGM and child marriage, for me, are the same issue. Why the leaders of Africa are not doing anything? Because in their family you find that. They practice FGM, 
and they practice child marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's about time that the EU and everybody that put money in FGM against, against FGM and child marriage start asking accountability from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we can stop this. Mm -hmm. Because if we keep on facing it on the, on the ground, I hear the, the, I hear the pain of the girls. Mm -hmm. And you cannot go back and punish anybody. That sense of not being punished allowed and enabled FGM to continue and child marriage to continue. I've met so many girls with tears in their eyes asking me for help, and sometimes I, felt, I feel completely powerless. Poverty is not just to marry your child away. It's the lack of dignity that we let to the poor people that make them make this decision. So for me, I'm gonna talk about it about on, on another level. We always use poverty, but basically what poverty is about is the dignity to live a decent life. Mm -hmm. And that is not given to people in places like Africa. In Africa, we all know very well, sitting here is the most richest continent on the planet. How do we African can take responsibility about that issue? The wealth we have, why can it help us save our children? With UNICEF last year, when we launched this video, we went to a community called Suava, that is on the water, where the new, the new invention of the guys now, right now, is you kidnap a girl, you rape her, and you make her your wife. I'm not really. So, with UNICEF and the, the, the post that we put in that village, there are many issues we face it. So I faced the, 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 the deputy minister of health in Benin. I faced the local chief, uh, chief of the village chief. Everybody comes there and I say, okay, now, are those girls perceived as human beings in your community? Are they just gonna be utilities or they're gonna be human beings? And the question, everybody feel offended when I ask the question. I say, if you feel offended by that question, so define to me what a girl means to you. Mm. What a child means to you. If it's a girl and you say you love your girl, why do you accept that and why can't we stop this? So with the video that we did in Benin, it becomes obvious that now, even in the villages, that there's people that doesn't speak French or English, they cannot shy away from the spotlight we put on them to help us stop child marriage and female genital mutilation. And we need the government to be on our side, not only doing it, but also to be in clear light about this. The suffering of the girls is something that is in my head every day. I go to sleep with the, the tears. I go to sleep with the cry, the mute cry of a child that is like, it's painful. I'm sitting across the girl, and before she opened her mouth, her whole body is pain. She's relieving everything. And you're like, why and how? So all I say to the girl is, you are not alone. They are not, it's not only UNICEF that is willing to help you, but if you reach out to UNICEF, we're gonna find a line of, we're gonna have an alliance of people that are gonna deal with it, that are gonna help you regain your confidence, your humanity. It's about time we start thinking about different way of doing what we are doing. What we have been doing so far is not working perfectly for the children that we have to save. Mm -hmm. So we all have to sit down and come up with plan based on each country. Mm -hmm. This is what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna do. And we're gonna cross reference of what we're doing because it's too, it's, it's too much. Uh, thank you so much, Angelique, uh, for, <laughs> uh, for this passion. I'm going to, uh, actually, I think that you, you, you really touch a very important issue, which is accountability from the top, from, uh, from duty barriers and from, from governments. And I, 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 th this year, the IAC for 6 February, uh, this, the, the, the theme of the year was ending FGM is a political decision. Mm. It has to be a clear, clear commitment, investment, 
and decision from the government, from the top, from parliamentarians, from politicians. It has to be punishment too it to the family. It has to that be because there. That's, we are seeing that the countries where progress has been made are countries where there is a strong political will from the yeah. top to the bottom level. Yep. Putting everybody and asking, you know, and, and everybody is accountable now. Mm -hmm. Religious leaders, traditional leaders, but also, also the families. Mm. And I can cite here a, a country, Burkina Faso, we have seen the president this morning. They are putting the father and the mother in prison. That's it. I said that. And I that. can tell you that we are dropping from 78% of prevalence rates. Now we are talking about about 11% of girls aged 0 to 15. Nobody wants to go to prison. Mm -hmm. So that is a strong, and we reaffirm the political will is absolutely needed. They use that everywhere, pretty much. Thank you so much. So uh, we are going to uh, move to uh, votes. Please, if you have your apps, mm -hmm. we have a question for you, because uh, you are, uh, uh, we don't uh, want uh, you no. only to listen, but Sorry. also to participate yes. a little bit. Yes, the minister is uh, going to uh, give her perspective. Just uh, please, uh, there is two questions. So the first question, uh, can, you, can we have it on the screen? Yes, so you have the first question. We just want to make sure that you know mm. how many Whoa. girls do you think <laughs> are married every year? In childhood per year. Two million, nine million, 12 million, as they told me. Now. Exactly, so please uh, vote for that. And the second question is mm. how many girls, yes? Oh, we need to wait, okay. <laughs> So please, everybody with the app voting. Mm -hmm. How many girls? I already give you the answer. Per year. <coughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, ah. great. Uh, wow. We have a very, very good knowledgeable yeah. audience here. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> and uh, the second question. Regarding female genital mutilation, how many girls are at risk of undergoing female know. genital mutilation between 2015 and 2030? So is it 5 million, 27 million, 68 million, if we do not do what we are supposed to do? Please vote. Yes? Wow. wow, 68 million. 68 million. Thank you so much. A Whoa. round of applause Whoa. for everybody. Whoa. So those are two Whoa. numbers that are very, very important to keep in mind mm -hmm. and remind everywhere. And please tweet it. Let's not forget how important it is. We are going to uh, move to uh, Minister Nemitu Ambisa Bonsa. Uh, Minister, uh, we know that government and decision makers, and we have already put you on the spot with a political <laughs> decision, <laughs> but uh, you are so essential and you have a so important role to play uh, in reducing these harmful practices against girls and women. Uh, Ethiopia has seen a considerable decline in child marriage over the past 25 years and on female genital mutilation over the past 10 years, you have been able to reduce FGM by 34%. Uh, so we just want to congratulate you first. Thank you so much, Ethiopia, you're leading. How did the government and partners bring about this decline? Can you just share a little bit of your lessons? Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you while you invite me to be part of the panel. The national efforts have been taken on reducing the practice of child marriage and the female genital mutilation uh, through different uh, uh, implementation. Ethiopia has seen a considerable decline in child marriage and uh, female genital mutilation in the past 25 years through the combination of efforts, the first one is the political commitment. Ethiopia has set a target of reducing both practice of child marriage and the female genital mutilation to 0.5% by 2025 in the country's GTP2. 
and are committed to develop a costed roadmap to achieve this, and also envisioned to free one third of the Waradas or district every two years since 2017. Mm. Monitoring of this effort is undertaken through the Parliamentary Standing Committee. And the second is creation of an enabling environment. The country has over 10 years of sus sustained and a progressive double-digit growth related expansion of and investments in education and employment opportunities creating pathway for girls in particular to have alternative to child marriage and female genital mutilation. And also growing urbanization which contributes to alternative to traditional practices and the norms including for child marriage and female genital mutilation. Established coordination mechanism from federal to district level, mm -hmm. like national alliance to end child marriage and female genital mutilation, anti-HTP -H -type, committee, anti-female genital mutilation, coalition in the regions and others, and well-organized community structures, like women development groups, women association, religious and the community leaders. The third one is investment in the evidence-based programming. Mm. The programs being implemented in Ethiopia at federal and the regional level with the support of government are guided by an evidence-based theory of change that is contextualized for the specific context. Mm. Investment in or use of high quality research data to inform the programming, including choice of sites. The fourth mechanism is mass engagement and mobilization at all levels, including grassroots levels. Mm. Through health extension workers, women development army, facilitated community groups that meet regularly on development issues. And also religious leaders and the faith-based organization are influential and have also offered their support to end harmful practices. And also engagement of the media to aware the people or the community. The best practice which, need, which we need to share for you is to, elim the, to elimination of the practice, the government works at grassroots level and hand in hand with the communities, boys and girls, women and men, and the most importantly, traditional and religious leaders, abagadas, women development army, and health extension workers to reach the hearts and the mind of millions of people and also create community ownership through awareness creation activities. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, this is definitely a comprehensive program that you are implementing in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and congratulations for that. Uh, and particularly the women's groups. I mean, I was really impressed by the women's groups and the health extension workers. Uh, it's a very, very good uh, practice uh, that uh, is uh, led by women themselves to protect their own uh, you know, ch children and their own daughters and all. So they are like role models. So it's a really a fantastic experience. And the commitment of the government of Ethiopia also is really commended. Uh, I would like to, Marie-Pierre, now to ask you a drawing from, uh, you know, the experience of the two global programs on child marriage and uh, female genital mutilation uh, that UNICEF is leading with UNFPA. Uh, can you share, uh, you know, some of the, you know, experience and the, the contribution of those programs to uh, make the change happen uh, at country level? Thank you. Yes, I, I thought of how to answer briefly that question and like some of the other uh, people, I'd like to tell a, a story about one young woman. Her name in this case is Afiba. 
uh, it's important, I think, that when we talk about numbers and uh, systems, we remember that behind there's individual lives, and even if all of us have our individual story, each and every one matters. So Afiba comes from Niger. I met her um, recently in my last visit. Interesting to know that Niger is the country with the highest prevalence of um, child marriage in the world. 76% What? of the girls are married before their 18th birthday Ooh. and 24% married before they turn 15. Afiba was married, uh, was in second grade when her father decided to marry her off, in this case, to a 30-year-old, wasn't at 45, uh, and put an end to her childhood. Uh, she was, um, she was uh, physically and uh, sexually abused by the husband repeatedly. The mother-in-law was also um, uh, somebody okay. who made her work very long days, sometimes asked her to sleep outside, not even being fed. And um, when Afiba turned 14, she became pregnant. Because of all kinds of complications in pregnancy, she gave birth to a stillborn baby. And then when she left the health center after some days and got home, something clicked in her mind and she said she needed to find a way to escape from this reality. She started by planting ground nuts behind the house and selling it to the local market, put together about uh, 10 uh, euros in uh, France CFA, bought a bus ticket, went to her aunt's village, and the aunt um, welcomed her, so the importance of what you said of really engaging different actors of society, and the aunt put her in touch with the local partners of the UNFPA, UNICEF, global programs. There, she uh, was welcomed in a non-formal education center. She received medical and social, psychosocial care. She received life skill education. And little by little, um, she regained her self-confidence. Mm. You talked about that. I think it's very important, that aspect of things. And today at 18, she's a leader of a woman support group. Should get her to meet her. Um, a, a support group for former child brides and domestic violence. And her aim, the way she phrases it, is that she wants to become a tailor, have her own sewing machine, but basically she wants to be financially independent. Yep. In her uh, mind, when you do not have the resources, you, by default, become dependent on a man, it can be the father, the husband, the brother. And um, she thinks that um, a way out of all of this is, um, is financial, uh, financial independence. So uh, this is just one example of how the UNICEF, UNFPA global program works for hundreds of um, thousands of, uh, of young women. These programs have uh, five pillars. I'll just list them. To, to they echo quite well this, um, this very comprehensive approach that you described. The first is the legal and the policy framework. It needs to be legal uh, to, to practice this. It helps. So we want governments to adopt but then implement laws that protect young people. The second is about appropriate and quality services. Health services adapted to girls, but I think education, formal and non-formal, and life skills is very important. The third pillar is about girls' and boys' participation and empowerment. Uh, very important to promote self-confidence and allowing young people to, we, we use the word, co-create solutions, context-specific solutions that work uh, to direct their own future. Fourth is community engagement and mobilization because it's important to engage the families, the communities, the traditional leaders uh, to review their attitudes and support the girls in these choices. And the last one uh, sounds a bit uh, more bureaucratic, but very important. It's about collecting data and analyzing trends. Because we can't just have good intentions, we actually need to see results and the situation to start changing. Otherwise, as Angélique said, we need to do something else. So with UNFPA, uh, we are really seeing important results of these joint programs, but we do share your, your sense of urgency. This needs to be taken to the next level. We need to shift gear, and uh, we really need everyone's support. Thank you so much, Marie-Pierre. Uh, so, uh, Morisanda, I would like to ask you uh, what uh, finally you're seeing as, uh, uh, you know, uh, how can we bring the change 
and uh, which are the, what, which challenges you know are we still seeing? Merci beaucoup. Je pense que. Well, thank you very much. I think we've got enough distance now to see what exactly we want to do. We want to abolish FGM. Now, as I see it. We need to approach the countries where FGM exists, and even the countries where it doesn't. We need to make, ask them to make it into a true development priority. As I've said many times, roads are good, building is good, but what are all these things for? They're there for that little girl. That's what they're for. But if she is deprived of her organs, if she is pinned to her bed because she bears the consequences of FGM, then she doesn't need any highways. She won't use them. She doesn't need electric light because even when the electric light is on, she can't enjoy it. So it's got to be a national priority. And when I say priority, I mean it's got to be a priority at national level especially, I think, in Africa. And the governments have really got to grip, get to grips with it. We really want to make FGM a thing of the past. It's not about asking for money and say, hey, let's have a grand project. No. The national budgets must have money, national money set aside to crack down on FGM and child marriage. It's got to be there, black on white. The other challenge that we face is that we could carry on going into villages as NGOs, going to see people for a hundred years. If we did do it collectively at village level, at national level, regional level, at international level, if we don't go at it all guns blazing, it will be a complete waste of time. So, the point isn't to have a nice conference here in Brussels and enjoy ourselves. There's all kinds of people in here, but we need to get together in the villages. And the, the Villages have got to be there, the nation has got to be there, the government has got to be there, and the NGOs have got to be there, all together. That's it. If we could have an international meeting in Brussels and a grassroots meeting in a little village as well, then I think we'd be able to make progress. But that's the way I see things going. If we really want to do useful work protecting little girls. The second thing is, we've got to remember that, uh, that, that we must get the idea out of our heads that, FG, that, that, that cracking down on FGM is helping girls and women. No, it's not just about girls and women. It's about protecting and respecting their rights. It's not some nice government program giving women a present. No, it's, it's their rights. They're entitled to their bodies. No one has any right to remove any part of their bodies. It's as simple as that. And I'd say this approach must be taken together. We can get it done if we all join hands. Thank you. Merci, Morissanda. Well, thank you very much. Marisanda? Yeah, but Ethiopia, you also have a question from uh, the audience. Uh, they're asking, how does Ethiopia verify the figures it collects on FGM, particularly uh, the figures, some of the data that uh, you have? How did you uh, were able to, um, to get those data? This is from the, the crowd. Mm. They want to know. Thank you very much. Um, as I told you, we have uh, many partners from the grassroots level, the health extension workers uh, who daily work with the women development groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, women develop development groups are those families who are living near to each other, 
knows each other daily and exchange information about their life. They have attachment with health extension worker. This is one way how they have got real data. The other is the religious leaders and uh, a wonderful Abagadas who leads the clan and uh, his message and what he passed in his decision really enacted by the community. These are the way how we collect the data and the other is the Women Association. Women Association, they have got uh, their members data and this data is collected from the community. And the other is the CSA. The CSA is the reliable data which the government used even for allocating budget and for his programming and everything. This is the way how we collect the data. And also, uh, currently, the EDHS data is one of the reliable data which the government put the indicators in the data collection system so that uh, this is how, how Ethiopia can use. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I hope that she answered your question. There is another question from the panelists, actually, who uh, seem there is actually two panelists who uh, say that when we are talking about gender-based violence, including uh, uh, these two forms of violence against women, uh, it's we are always pinpointing uh, Africa. And so uh, the panelists say that, I mean, the... the, the, the the, the, the person said that we should stop stigmatizing Africa. I think that Dr. Kuyate uh, mentioned that uh, these two practices are beyond Africa. He yep. mentioned a lot of countries. So uh, uh, we do have data uh, for a few of those countries, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Indonesia, but we do not have data for a lot of countries and comparable data. So basically, when we present this data, we are saying that the data are for FGM for 30 countries with data comparable. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the child marriage database is larger than that from DHS and mix. But we do know that the practice is done in a lot of other spaces. Uh, Africa is leading this agenda. And I think that this is, for once, this is something that we need to recognize. That's true. There is a lot of other countries it's who true. are yeah. shying away and do not want to recognize that there are ethnic groups who are practicing FGM in their country. But Africa has taken the lead, courageously recognized that this is a practice, these are practices and they are really trying to act toward it. Of course, there is a lot of uh, problems, but I would like to, I think that this space is also a space where we need to call for other, other countries and other governments to, uh, you know, uh, come and, and, and also share the experience and present the data. So having said so, Minister, uh, we had a question for you because he mentioned uh, funding and domestic resources. So the question uh, will be actually uh, regarding domestic resources to end harmful practices. And how do you see it and how can we strengthen it a little bit more? Thank you. In 2014, as the London Gender Summit, the government of Ethiopia committed to develop a cost roadmap to end child marriage and the female genital mutilation by 2025. This includes strengthening of accountability mechanism and the budget increased by 10% for effort to prevent and um, these practices. To identify, advocate for and ring fence domestic invest investment and interventions that protect girls at scale and to mobilize other resources, both domestically and from outside. Ethiopia has taken the initiative to develop a costed roadmap and a plan to end child marriage and female genital mutilation by 2025. Under the leadership of the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs and with the support of the National Alliance to End Child Marriage and Female Genital Mutilation, including civil society organizations, development of the plan has involved the engagement of all 
relevant bureaus at federal and regional level. This participatory exercise has helped build ownership as well as help us ensure it is both realistic as well as context specific. Netting the ethnic, the religious, and the geographic diversity of the country, what works in one region will not necessarily work in another region. Engagement of and ownership by all stakeholders critical given the size and the diversity of the country. The current state of the plan is as follows. A draft has been received from the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs. The ministry will soon convey all the participating ministers at federal level and the bureaus at regional level to review the draft plan, make some adjustment, and then the process will be finalized, endorsed, and roll out the plan. This is the way how we uh, communicate and uh, uh, campaign for the budget from the outside and as well as in the, in the domestic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. This is so important, actually, that each country you know, also uh, have a budget line and yeah. use some of the domestic resources uh, to tackle this issue. Sure. Uh, thank you. So Natalie, I will turn on you and can you talk a little bit about the younger, young people to make this change happening? Um, thank you very much. So good news everyone. Young people are not lazy. <laughs> young people do not lack skills. And young people are not the, the leaders of the future. We are leading change now. So my organization is already creating safe spaces for girls back at home. And the interesting thing is that being the first young women-led organization and also youth movement back at home, we are organizing, we are mobilizing, and we are campaigning to end female genital mutilation and child marriage. And do you know what? Within just three years, we are already working with 30,000 community members. What does that mean? That young people, when given the right kind of support, they can indeed make change. So what we are trying to do and what we are working with young people to be agents of change is that we have an after-school program that is already deconstructing FGM because, for instance, in my community, you're you'll begin being talked about FGM when you're nine years old. And that's the point where we begin having conversation with the children. And each and every single week, we are talking to about 300 children between seven to 10 years. And that also improved their literacy skills. And one of the most interesting thing that I've learned is that 60 girls in our program personally convinced their parents to attend monthly sessions to learn on the impact of FGM. Mm. And the good news is that all the parents have made a commitment that they're not going to, cut to, to allow their girls to undergo female genital mutilation this year. So that in itself shows that young people, when given the right kind of support, they can indeed make a difference. Look at, look at for instance, uh, the movement back at home in Kenya. It's being led by young movement, and uh, young, young people, sorry. And what we are saying is that we do, not want to be, we, do, we do not want people to speak on our behalf. We have undergone the cut, we have undergone the cut, and we have undergone violence by ourselves, and we understand. And what we need is for you to allow us to have that particular space so that we can bring our innovation. Like I said, we have skills. We have proven that, indeed, we can lead. We are not lazy. We are working day and night to ensure that we, only, we, we not only create a better world for ourselves, but for the ones who are coming behind us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you so much. We count on your dynamism and energy. Angelique, do you want to add something? What else do you see that needs to happen to make this change happen and to see that tomorrow we will see the zero case of uh, child marriage and FGM? I think the first thing that has to happen for me is accountability. Exactly. If any country receives any fund that is allocated to female genital mutilation or child marriage, that fund has to be followed by accountability. Mm -hmm. So far, the government in Africa received those funds for the last 30 or 40 years and nothing happens. So we need to have accountability. 
We can work at the grassroots if our leaders are not held accountable, are not caught up with their hand in the pots, mm. we won't get anywhere. And I think also that we need to come up with different way of approaching child marriage campaign and female genital mutilation. I think that the men don't understand the pain that the women go through when it comes to female genital mutilation. Hmm. They don't see it, they don't care. I would suggest that we come up with a cartoon that really describe what it is to be caught and make it graphic enough and explain it well enough. It's gonna be a shocking, but well, we have to do this mm -hmm. and, and talk in every different languages where the FGM is practiced in, practiced in Africa. And this is something that you young kids can come up with an idea and do that cartoon and launch it on TVs around the country mm. for the people to see, the men and women to see what it is, the pain and the hell that a girl goes through because just because she's born a girl. Doctor said, female genital mutilation is not about saving the girls, it's about their rights. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. So in order for us to deal with female genital mutilation and child marriage, we need to bring the men into this discussion. If they have the right to their body, so are we. Exactly. So if we just oppose their body to a woman's body, if female genital mutilation is not shocking enough for them, what can we do to them? And what are they willing to give up if they were in the position of women? The fact that they cannot put themselves in our shoes make our issue very difficult to get to them. Mm -hmm. So how do we make them, make, we ch ch let's change the mirror a little bit and say to the men, if you wanna help us really in the women issues, first of all, look at what it does when the child is giving birth and when the child is caught. Do you wanna marry a woman like that? If the men start saying, we don't wanna marry any cut woman, it's gonna stop. Mm -hmm. So we have to shift a little bit our campaign from just the girl, keep the pressure on that, mm -hmm. but focus on main responsibility. Responsibilize them about what is going on. Mm -hmm. You cannot have every right in the world without consequences and responsibility. Mm -hmm. So far, the men have had it all the way they wanted to without holding one second, step up back and said, is what I'm doing, is it right or not? Mm -hmm. You cannot have all the rights because you cannot alone make this world we count for it. So I think that making the girls victim of this situation doesn't help the issue. Girls that have been married early, they come up. Some of them, they, they run. Mm -hmm. I met a little girl, Clementine in Benin. She was married by force, kidnapped. And the house where they took her was in the middle of water. Most of the people in my country, they don't know how to swim. She was willing to jump in that water, not knowing how to swim in the darkness, pitch dark night. She said, I'd rather die than go through this. She was just, what, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So she knows that she can save her own life. It's not that we lack courage, we, women. We need to call upon the courage of men for them to face their responsibility in this issue. Mm -hmm. They need to help us stop female genital. We, we want to get to 2030 or whatever time we set up for ourselves here, the men have to feel the heat. We get, we, they are off the leash too fast and too early. No man, as my father say, have the right to take the right of a woman away because you are a man. Being a man doesn't mean you are an abuser. And the question I've been asking since I was a kid, and I'm still waiting for an answer to that question, what is a man? What makes a man a man? We have to define that to be able to bring our agenda from forefront. And I think that we need also the data on men in Africa about female genital mutilation. There are a lot of them that are against it. Where are the voices? Mm -hmm. And if the men that are for female genital mutilation, we need to know, know the amount, the number, and then we can go talk to them and say, this is what's going on.
You love your children, you love your mother, you love your family. This is what they go for. So far, we've been too nice in all this. Without the men being faced with the responsibility. A child of 12 years old that has been impregnated by the man of 40, 45. The day the girl is giving birth, that guy is standing up there and looking at it. He got to say it. If you don't see the pain she goes through to give birth, you won't stop it. Mm -hmm. The men are like, oh, we do this, and they walk away free. You don't walk away free anymore. We hold you by your hand and come bring you down there. You're going to see it. And I think that's one thing that we have to think about in the campaign we're going to start doing. How we sensibilize the men, not about the tradition, not about uh, the female genital mutilation itself, but the consequences of it. Mm. And they are part of that abuse. <laughs> they practice it or not, the fact that they accept to have sexual intercourse with women that are caught, that goes through hell for their own pleasure, is something that is absolutely not acceptable. I mean, relationship between a man and a woman cannot be about pain. And it's not all to have to bear the pain. So if the men are afraid of our sex, it's their business, we gotta deal with that too. So for me, Let's change the narrative here. Let's change a little bit. Let's shift. Let's do data, collect data in all those countries and see what the men are saying about this. For us women to be able to tell them with the help of professionals of health, the government also for them to face their responsibility, for them to know that not acting, every child suffer this. They don't see it, we gotta make it graphic. For me, that's what I have to say. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angelique. It is so strong. Uh, I think that we are almost at the end of uh, the, our time. Uh, we have a few questions here, and I would like Dr. Morissanda, I think you are in a very good uh, position to respond to those questions. Uh, there is some question uh, regarding the involvement of Europe. Knowing that uh, uh, FGM and also uh, child marriage are also practiced in Europe, particularly yep. the FGM, and how the diaspora uh, should be more involved. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, several NGOs here in Belgium, like GAMS, uh, a lot of other working. We have a NFGM European network. So they want to know, you know, what can be done with the diaspora also and how they can be involved to make sure that the change is happening also altogether. Okay, Please. thank you. Merci beaucoup, c'est une très bonne question. Thank you very much, it's a good question. And I remember back in 2001, I had the honor of being here with our committee and with the First Lady of Burkina Faso in order to present the report on the subject to the European Parliament. And what the report did was set out the first ever overview of FGM in Europe and which proposed ways of taking action to eradicate it. Now, after the vote back in 2001, the European Parliament immediately allocated money so that NGOs in Europe and Africa would work hand in glove. Now, it didn't go well because You needed Africans to come here and tell people what was happening on the FGM front. And we were very much invited to raise awareness in Parliament. But as soon as the money had been earmarked, the European NGO said, aha, that's for us. The Africans shouldn't have anything to do with it. <coughs> Go back to Africa. So, it's a big, it's a, FGM has become a money problem, is that it? Well, let's try to avoid that in future. It's not a money issue. It's a problem of stopping FGM. It's not a, a challenge of wanting to go on TV. It's not wanting to have a vote. 
elections. That's not what it's all about, not at all. We've got to work hand in glove together. As I said, together with Europe, there is no continent is as hostile to FGM as much as Europe is, apart from Africa. But we need a paradigm change. We need to really work together, I'm properly working together. If there's an EU member of the European Parliament getting together with a president from Africa, with an NGO working in Africa, if they get together, together with the UN, and if they go door to door in any country in the world and talk about SGM, they can make progress. They will make progress. So it's vital to make sure that if we want to work together, we need to know exactly what our objective is. And that's why when the Inter-African Committee was set up, right back in 1984, we set up Inter-African groups and also Inter-African Committees outside Africa, in New Zealand, in Japan, in, in, in Europe, in order to follow the African diaspora all around the world. And the last thing I'd like to say is that we also don't want to say, right, well, uh, it, 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 it's barbaric, it's savages, we need to help them to shake off their barbaric habits. No, this is a breach of human rights. Just as there are breaches of human rights in Europe, America, and Asia. So let's work together. Let's come up with, with programs together. And I'm delighted to say we have got the joint program in front of us. And this joint program needs to be extended. I'd like something more overarching so that money and human resources can be pooled together so we can divide, we can, we can spread the tasks and really make progress. That's what I wanted to say. And I really want to say just now that money isn't the heart of the matter. No, the thing is giving women, their girls, their rights. Thank you very much. Well, to see, uh... well again, um, yes, you, you talked about the partnership issue again and how that needs to be enforced between Africa and the diaspora so that we can all work together and make sure we're singing from the same hymn sheet. But you also talked about the role of pioneers people who can get the message out, as we, as we heard from Angelique and others. So we can get more money made available for these very important issues, such as child marriage and FGM. But perhaps I could say, when I talk about the diaspora, there's also forced marriage, which is a very important issue that we come across in communities living outside Africa. Three minutes now, and I would like to call you just if you have one last recommendation for the way forward. And maybe, uh, Marie-Pierre, maybe you can uh, start in a few seconds, you know, what could be, you know, the, the, the recommendation uh, that you can Yes, write. I will, but I just want to say to the member of the audience who was wondering whether to speak about what's done in Africa is stigmatizing that mm -hmm. um, the way we look at it is exactly the other way around. Mm -hmm. Africa is looking at data. Mm -hmm. Leadership in Africa is acting on data. Mm -hmm. Civil society and young people are moving forward the agenda. And as you rightly said, it's uh, great that this issue has strong, strong leadership in the, in the continent and is not something run from, from elsewhere. My one recommendation would be maybe to invest in positive alternatives to child marriage. Uh, you said poverty is not um, the, right the whole right. story. Uh, a lot of parents marry children also with an alleged protection measure to make sure the girls don't float in societies are protected. So what could be the positive alternative, and we'd like to uh, see much more investment in girls' education and much stronger links between the education for girls with quality and the ending child marriage agenda so that the young girls are equipped not only to not get married early, but then to shape their own future. 
Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, Minister, do you want uh, to share a last recommendation with the audience? Yeah, my recommendation is very short. Mm -hmm. Please, all of us should have to work on girls' education and women economic empowerment. Okay. Thank you. So thank, two you. Of us. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Morisanda, mm -hmm. last well, my, recommendation. My last recommendation is um, 2030 is too far. Hmm. We have to end FGM before that. End it. Hmm. We sure. can't continue to Faster. fix all time 15 years, 15 years, and continue to cut million and billion of mm. girls. So my recommendation is, okay, 2030 is a UN objective, but we should end FGM before that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Maurice yeah. Sanda. And uh, Nathalie? Um, you've, just, you've just said what I wanted to say. It's about time we, we you know, end FGM became a past narrative, but from where we work at the grassroots level, what we believe that could be most effective is uh, what, what has already been said, increased political commitment. Because if my political leader stands up and says that FGM is not something that should be discussed, mm. people are not going to listen. Mm -hmm. But if he stands up and says that it is, uh, it is, it is infringement of women's rights, it is infringement of our privacy, then we'll start to have the conversation. So. I'm calling out on all the leaders who have not made a commitment. Mm. Kindly, let's all make that commitment and support whatever action is already going on to make the difference, to make the world safer and better for all of us. Thank you so yeah. much. And I think that you have a role for that because yeah. you as young people need to put pressure and lobbying also your political you know, uh, yeah. uh, representative to make sure that this is happening. I am not giving my member of parliament sleep each and every time he hears our conversation. So yeah. we would actually, yeah. I would like to ask him what, I don't know, can I tell him from here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that my member of parliament, I would like to see you take up more role in supporting our community to end female genital mutilation. And I hope that message gets to him really, mm. yeah. I think that, I, I just want, I'm um, sorry, there is, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to insist on that again. Because if you look at the demographic today, particularly in Africa, you are the majority, sure. right? And in terms of uh, also uh, the capacity to vote, because in a country like Kenya, for example, we are hearing a lot that, you know, because of the elections and voting and all, so some of the political, uh, you know, leaders, uh, you know, want to really shy away from this issue because they're sensitive and know they don't, don't want to lose votes. So I think that you need really to be conscious that you are starting to be a majority and you need to also show that you have that election card, you know, that is counting and reverse somewhere that trends or tendency that people think and politicians think that you know, if they talk about this sensitive issue, then they will lose election, they will lose their vote. But no, we are here, and we are supporting you, and we are the majority, and if you do not do that, then we are not going to elect you. So I hope that, uh, Natalie, uh, you will continue uh, to be a very uh, strong leader, you know, with uh, young people. Uh, and, uh, on the matter of uh, harmful practices, FGM, and both uh, child marriage. So the last, the last uh, is Angelique, of course. Oh, why do so <laughs> Angelique, <laughs> Angelique, because I think that this is so important. Your voice is important, and your beautiful voice is important. The, your your musician, what you're doing, and how do you see actually maybe one recommendation on what we could do to mobilize more maybe this entertainment vo world? I uh, think uh, I'll come back to the word accountability. We've let so many people off the hook that continue the abuse of the girls. Educating a girl is saving our society, our family, our community, and the world at large. It's proven today by the numbers that when you educate a girl, the GDP of the country rises up. Mm -hmm. But in order for that girl to achieve all her potential, we need accountable leaders to give her safe space, mm -hmm. to give her all the power that she needs to really bloom and to go out in the world and take what is hers. Mm. And 
Accountability is not a, very, a light word in my mouth. It's not only the political people that we, hold, we have to hold accountable. We have to hold our people accountable. Mm -hmm. We have to hold villages accountable. When we start something and they tell us this is what we're going to do, we got to be there for them and help them achieve what they ask us to achieve. We have to hold men around the world accountable to the responsibility of peace on this earth. The peace doesn't exist without women being safe. So accountability, accountability is all at the base roots of everything that we talk about here. Coming together demands accountability. If we come together and we have a goal, how do we come back and say, this is what we have achieved and this is what we are not able to achieve and how we didn't achieve it. So accountability has to be at the center of it. We're talking about money, money, money. Mm. So, many mo so much money that I've spent that are sent by individuals, by EU, by all those places, billions of dollars that have been sent to fight against child marriage, female genital mutilation, acute malnutrition, vaccination, and, and on and on. And we're still here talking about it because we don't follow the money. And we don't point the finger. We have to start shaming the people that say they're going to do this and they don't do it. And if we don't do it, we're never going to get nowhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, this is the end of uh, this uh, uh, panel. And I would like, of course, to uh, thank the distinguished uh, panelists for sharing the experience, their perspective, the recommendation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and of course, before closing, uh, we have uh, um, a last question, actually, for the audience and those who are still here. Thank mm. you so much for staying. Mm. Uh, we would like to know uh, what is, in one word, you know, your takeaway message. And uh, same thing, same uh, application, if you can just uh, share your thought. It's going to appear here on the screen. One word. What is your takeaway message? Thank you for this panel. And uh, I would like just to... Political uh, will, accountability. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I would like just to uh, say that uh, this panel was uh, the panel on uh, free from violence and uh, uh, free to change the world. And we have seen again and on a very, with data, but also with human stories and a lot of examples here how uh, what F how FGM and uh, child marriage are affecting, actually, and impacting uh, the girls' lives and the women's lives. And uh, I think that we have almost been a little bit emotional at some moments. And we have also uh, discussed really and uh, that, you know, the political commitment, the political will is one of the key element. A ending these practices is a political decision. If we want to end it, we can, we can, we can end it. The time is now to end these practices. And as a lot of speakers said, we are not waiting 2030. We are, we really want to see this practice end, you know, before that in a few years. It's only take, a, I used to say it's only take a no to end uh, this kind of practice, and not from the parents, but the parents are like feeling like they are in prison and they have to do and they have to act on that way for X and Y reasons. So I think that we need to, what we heard today is that we need to change a little bit our m messages, change our interventions, look a little bit more on what really uh, could work uh, Angelique even mentioned that it is important to shock people, uh, to b show them what it is, and how this is really impacting, how this is really, uh, you know, destroying somewhere girls and women's lives. Uh, we also heard a lot about accountability. Accountability mechanism need to be put in place. Accountability need to be strengthened at community uh, level. Accountability need to be strengthened at uh, district level, at uh, local, within local governments, with national governments, and also with regional institutions like the African Union, 
the uh, ECOWAS, uh, SADC, uh, and of course here in the diaspora uh, who, with countries who are um, uh, communities, of course, who are practicing FGM and who are living in the diaspora of Europe, of the US, of New Zealand, etc. Accountability for me is also the recognition from several parts of the world that FGM is practiced in the community. Uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, all these countries, they are not here today, but they are not here because we are still working towards you know, uh, making sure that they are realizing that what is practiced there is a violation also of girls and women's rights, and there is not so much recognition so far from the political space and from the religious leaders. And we also heard a lot about uh, the need for domestic investment and the role of young people, young people everywhere. It is quite important and they have a lot of energy, and uh, we are we're really happy to have Natalie today sharing with your, us her experience, the need for data and all. So uh, I think that this is a race that can be won, and we can really win that race uh, all together in partnership and a strong, strong partnership and a strong relationship with the different actors at government, civil society, religious leaders, and all the different uh, stakeholder. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this session on free from violence and free to change the world. And we wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you to the panelists.